You know, one of the rugged realities of life is that every single one of us, every one of us, will at some point get to the end of ourselves. There will come a point, if you've been around for more than about 45 minutes, there has already come a point where you have faced a challenge, an obstacle, maybe a, maybe a grief or a loss that you had no idea how to overcome in your own power. That's, that's part of living. The good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel, stands as a shining beacon about the power of God to overcome, to overcome every single obstacle, no matter the challenge, no matter the circumstances, no matter what the naysayers or doubtics, doubters, cynics, or skeptics have to say, the gospel always works. The gospel of Jesus Christ always overcomes every single time. A few years ago, I was working out one morning with, with a guy that had become a really close friend of mine. He was my trainer. And uh, we were doing a particular workout on this day that was supposed to be done unbroken, meaning there were going to be multiple movements with multiple repetitions at each movement, and you were not supposed to stop until you had completed every rep of every movement. And when you first saw the workout written up on the whiteboard, you kind of went, oh, that's not that bad. But as the workout progressed, it got not only bad, it got horrific. I mean, terrible. And what had been easy at the beginning got gradually and progressively more and more difficult. There, there was one particular junction where you went from push-ups to box jumps. And as you would proceed through this workout, I started to, as, as my heart rate kept ramping up and up and up, I realized that I could kind of, kind of start to get myself a little bit of recovery if I just took my time between the elements. And so I did. But there came a point where my heart rate was getting like up around 175, 180. I mean, for me, that's redlining. I, I had never... I hadn't worked out this hard since I had been in the NBA. And some of y'all laughed a little too hard and a little too quick at that. But I, it was funny. But there was, there was this moment where I, I was in the middle of push-ups, and I mean, I was gassed, gasping for air, struggling. And, and I finished the, the last rep of the push-ups, and I just lay there on the floor. And as I was lying there, I, I, was, I was lying there and I, was, I, was, I started to pray and I, I was praying for like the rapture or maybe Jesus to take me home. I just wanted it to stop. When all of a sudden I sensed a presence very close to me and I opened my eye and my, my trainer, Webb Smith, was sitting there right in my grill and he goes, come on, Mac, how many can you do when you're tired? And, and, and I'm not proud of this, but I remember lying on the floor when he said, how many can you do when you're tired? And I, I had some ugly thoughts about his family that I, I didn't say out loud. <laughs> but I got up and, and finished the workout. Now, that's a, that's a silly example. You know, sometimes you finish a workout. Sometimes you bail on it. How many of you have ever bailed on a workout before you knew it was supposed to be over? It happens, Right. But sometimes in life, you can't bail. Isn't it true that, that sometimes we come up against things that we really and truly, I mean, we're praying that they would just stop. We really and truly don't see a way out or a way through. And we have literally come to the end of ourselves. We are, we are completely depleted spiritually, emotionally, maybe financially, and we're done. And that, in God's economy, is where God shows up. That's where the power of God, the miraculous, 
supernatural, creative power of God meets with human faithfulness to overcome. Overcoming is one of the hallmarks of our faith. The, the ultimate expression of this strong enough overcoming power is, of course, the resurrection of our Lord from the dead when he rose from the grave after he had been executed on a Roman cross. That is the foundational fact of our faith. That is the thing that we hang on to. That's the, that's the beacon of hope for all time. But it's not only that moment because the Bible is absolutely swarming with examples of regular ordinary people like you and me experiencing the extraordinary, irregular, supernatural power of God to overcome insurmountable obstacles, insurmountable odds in their lives. As we continue this series on the life of Joshua called Strong Enough, we, we come to a moment that is just like that as Israel is about to encounter their first military campaign to begin to lay hold of God's promise in the promised land. They have just completed this supernatural crossing of the geographical obstacle, the Jordan River. We talked about that last weekend. But here at Jericho, the Battle of Jericho, one of the most famous battles fought in human history. At the Battle of Jericho, they have encountered not just a geographical obstacle, but a military obstacle. This is where they are going to war. This is where actual warriors with actual weapons will be actually aimed at God's chosen people. And it's in this moment at Jericho that God gives you and me a, a template, an example to follow for overcoming in our lives. As fascinating as the story that is recorded in Scripture is, and it is, just on its own merits, I believe with everything I have that one of the primary reasons God saw fit to include the battle of Jericho in the scriptural canon is so you and I would learn something. There would be something that we could draw from when we encounter walls to be overcome. Now, Jericho is an interesting place. It was a, a city, and when you think about Jericho and you think about conquering one nation over one nation, at this time, most political entities were what we would call city-states. Jericho was a city-state. Israel was not yet anything. It was a, a holy nation that was on its way to become, a holy family that was on its way to becoming a holy nation, but they weren't there yet. But with Jericho, you have an established city-state that would have had a king who ruled his followers and a military that provided for the protection of Jericho. It was built on an embankment, it was at an elevated level, but the real genius of Jericho were the walls of Jericho. I, I wanna show you on a map kind of where Jericho was situated so you have in your mind's eye where this was all happening. I have my little uh, laser. How many of you, if you have any pets, you should get one of these. This, this is entertainment for hours for us. Pets, you rubber, drives them crazy. Anyway, what had happened, Israel was coming up from the south, Mount Nebo, Remember last week, they crossed from Shittim over the Jordan River. This is the Jordan River right here. That's the Sea of Galilee. Jesus spent a lot of time up there. The Jordan River comes down running north to south, goes through Gilgal into the Dead Sea right there. If you've ever been to the Holy Land, you know that you can float in the Dead Sea because it has so much salt in it. You don't even need floaties. But that wasn't how Israel crossed it. We talked about that last week. It was a supernatural miracle. They left the village of Shittim, crossed over, and right there is Jericho, just on the western edge of the Jordan River. It's kind of hard to see in those dots right there. That's Gilgal, that dot that's a little bit north of that. But Jericho is where we find them today. And as I said, the genius of Jericho was not in its elevated situation, but in the walls of Jericho. You may have heard the song, the, the old spiritual song, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Remember that? Probably never heard it sung that well before, but you, you may have heard it. Well, the walls of Jericho were what I would call a piece of military engineering genius. It wasn't just 
one wall that ran around the city. The city itself was only about seven acres. Archaeology tells us it was about seven acres. So picture roughly seven football fields, okay? Not, not a big space. But there was a system of walls that went around this seven-acre city-state. And it was actually two walls. The outer wall was six feet thick. So it was massive. Then, if you were able somehow to scale that outer wall, make it across the six feet span and get down, you had a gap between that and the next wall, the inner wall, which was 12 feet thick. And so before you could ever get to the 12 foot thick wall, you were down in the middle of this gap and you were a sitting duck for soldiers shooting down on you. So Jericho was a highly, highly secured space. And this was what Israel was facing as they approached their first military campaign in the promised land. There had been other battles and skirmishes as they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, but this was the one that would launch this military campaign. This was the one that they had to make sure they took care of Jericho, because here's what would happen. If they didn't take care of Jericho and continued pushing to the west, the whole time they were moving where God wanted them to move, they would be looking over their shoulders to see if Jericho was teaming up with other adversaries and coming after their rear guard. So that's where we find Joshua today. But before we ever get to any battle, any weapons being fired, Joshua has an encounter that actually lays the overcoming groundwork for the entire battle. It actually shows us how we are to respond when we come up against walls in our lives, when we find ourselves at the end of ourselves needing to overcome something. Look with me in Joshua chapter number five. I'm going to start with verses 13 and go through verse 15. The Bible says, now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Okay, so I want you to get the picture here. Joshua has this holy encounter with the commander of the Lord's armies. This is a literal messenger from God. And scholars are divided on who this actually was. It might have been one of God's angels. The word angel just means a messenger. It might have been a messenger from God. There are other biblical scholars who believe that this was actually an Old Testament appearance of Jesus himself. We don't know, but we do know that this was a message from God for Joshua. And the very first thing that happens, Josh goes, hey, are you with us or against us? Which, by the way, is a genius leadership question. That is a genius leadership moment to discern whether somebody is really with you or just kind of for you. You know what I mean? Or are they against you? But the answer, I think, is even more fascinating. This messenger from God says to Joshua, I'm not here for you or for Jericho. I'm here on behalf of the Lord. I'm here as a representative of God Almighty. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. Just put yourself in Joshua's sandals. I want you to think about if all of a sudden you think you're talking to a regular soldier, just somebody standing there with a drawn sword, that's kind of got you on edge a little bit. But then he says, I'm not here for you. I'm not here for Jericho. I'm here for the Lord Almighty. And Joshua falls on his face, the Bible says. He falls on his face in reverence. And so the example that he's given us here, as someone who is facing walls that are insurmountable, is you start 
when you validate your alignment with God. You start to overcome when you validate your alignment with God. We're not asking God to come along on our ride. We're asking God to bring us along on his ride. Anybody ever done that before? I have. I, man, if, if you're a single adult, have you, ever, have you ever dated somebody that you really, 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 really wanted to marry, but God just wasn't in it? You don't have to raise your hand, but we all kind of know what that feels like, right? I mean, it, it, when, you, when it's not clicking, when it's not right with God, it's not. But man, when, when you surrender your will, like Joshua did, when, when you say, what is God's messenger for his servant? God, I want to serve you. Not my will, but your will be done. That's what Joshua is saying here. He's aligning himself with God's purposes. And this is so, so critical because walls come in different shapes and sizes for different reasons. Some walls are there so we can see God do what only God can do. That there will be moments in your life as a follower of Christ where when we overcome with him in his name, we will, there will be no explanation other than God did it. <laughs> I, I don't know how he did it. All I know is that God did it. But there will also be some walls that God will allow in your life and in my life to use as guardrails to keep us from careening off the edge of the road and plunging into the ravine. Sometimes walls are there for our protection. And the only way we discern that, the only way we can distinguish that is by making sure, by validating our alignment with God. We ask for God's wisdom beyond our own, God's insight, his discernment that we don't have in and of ourselves. You see, the gospel's overcoming power is something that we don't have in and of ourselves. If somebody ever tells you, you the power is in you, you need to run for the hills. The power's not in you. The power's not in me. Tell your neighbor like you mean it with a smile on your face because you love them. Power's not in you. It's not. I don't care how big and bad you think you are. You ain't that big and bad to overcome every single wall that you will encounter in life. You're not. It only happens in the power of God. And yet, he invites us into that power. The Bible says that the same power that raised Christ from the dead is available to us day in and day out. But it begins when we align our posture with God's purposes. When we say, God, I want to be on your side. I want to be on your agenda. I want to fulfill your purposes, your priorities. This is yours, not mine. You validate your alignment with God. Now look, now, now, now we're getting ready to go to war. We're getting ready for the battle now. Chapter 6, verse 2 and following. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. And on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing their trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout, and then the wall of the city will collapse, and the army will go up, and everyone straight in. So there's this miraculous moment where God supernaturally intervenes, and this incredible defense system around Jericho just comes crumbling down. But if you'll notice... Joshua and the soldiers and even the priest had nothing to do with the walls come tumbling down. They didn't. They didn't blink twice like bewitched. They didn't 
wiggle their fingers and, and whisper incantations over the city of Joshua, <clears throat> all they did was the example that they set for us. It's one thing to validate your alignment, but we have to also demonstrate our faithfulness to God. God told them, march around the city one time for six days. Just go around the city. And on the seventh day, I want you to march around the city seven times. Then blow the horns and give a great shout and the walls will come down. All Joshua and the soldiers had to do was obey God. That was it. If they just did what God has said, they are, in fact, doing what God said. They are demonstrating their faithfulness. Here's the principle. God shows up with the miraculous when we show up with the obedience. God shows up with miraculous power that we don't have on our own when we are faithful, when we are obedient to what he has told us to do. You see, it's, it's the obedience that we put in the spiritual bank that we draw from in those moments when God shows up to give us the miraculous power to overcome whatever wall, whatever obstacle we're facing. And it's, it's been that way since the beginning of time. Look back at the life of Moses. When God called Moses at the burning bush to lead Israel out of Egyptian slavery, when did Moses' shepherd staff become a serpent? When he threw it down. God said, Moses, what's that in your hand? Moses goes, well, it's just the staff I used to shepherd my father-in-law's flocks. And God said, throw it down. And Moses just did something very, very natural. Moses didn't turn it into a snake. God did that after Moses showed up with the obedience. Look at the life of Peter. Peter, the rock upon whom Christ built his church. When did Peter walk on the water with Jesus? When he got out of the boat. Now, all Peter had to do was this. Watch. Except he didn't make that sound because it was water. But he just stepped out of the boat. That's a very natural thing. And that was when God showed up with the supernatural. Peter said, Lord, I, I want to come to you. Command me to come to you. And Jesus said, come to me. And Peter stepped out of the boat. God shows up with the miraculous when we show up with the obedient. That faithfulness is rewarded. That faithfulness overcomes walls and obstacles, griefs, mourning, hurt, a medical diagnosis that you can't change. That power overcomes all of those things. Now, that overcoming probably, probably is going to look a little different than you expect it to. Sometimes it's going to look different than you want it to, but make no mistake about it. In Christ Jesus, we are more than overcomers, the Bible says. This is the promise from a God who cannot lie to you. This is who he is. This is what he does. So look what happens. In verse 15, chapter 6. And then on the seventh day, they got up at daybreak. They marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, shout for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared because she hid the spies that we sent. But keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. So, we validate our alignment. We make sure that we are demonstrating faithfulness, obeying God, understanding what he has told us biblically, living that out. But before they ever lift up the shout or the trumpet's blast, 
Joshua says, make sure that you dedicate the victory to God. This victory is yours. What did he say? He goes, the Lord has given you Jericho. This victory is already won. But make sure that you dedicate it to God. This is not your victory. This is not my victory. This is God's victory. And so all of the spoils of war, all of the things that a regular army would normally keep to themselves, we are devoting to God. We are dedicating them to his service in his temple in worship of him. Make sure that you dedicate your victory to God. Isn't it true that when we win is one of the greatest spiritual challenges of life? When, when we are facing insurmountable odds and walls, man, we are all, we, we become automatic prayer warriors at that point, don't we? But when things are good, when you cash out your business, when, when the marriage is just, I mean, just clicking, chemistry, things are going on, it's happening, the kids are happy and moving around and everything's going, that is when it becomes very, very easy to forget who gave us the victory. That's a huge challenge. Abraham Lincoln said, trials test a man, but power reveals a man. You, you, wanna, you wanna reveal somebody's real heart? Give them a win. Give them a victory. Give them power. Give them money. Give them fame. That is where you see the heart of a man or a woman or a young person. Joshua's telling him here, make sure that you dedicate this victory to God. But he said something interesting in there that, that might have surprised some of you. He said, now remember Rahab the prostitute. Where did a talk of a prostitute come from in this conversation? Well, Joshua had sent some spies ahead of this campaign into the city of Jericho. They had gone in and done a reconnaissance mission, scoped it out, and as they were fleeing the city, they were being pursued by some Jerichoans, or Jerichoites, I don't know which one. <laughs> and they were given refuge in the home and the house of Rahab, this Jericho prostitute. And while they were taking refuge in there, Rahab struck a deal with them. She said, I'm begging you, as we, we know, we know that God is with Israel. We have heard about your, your reputation precedes you. So when you come into Jericho, please remember my family and me. And so the spies said that they would remember Rahab's home. Her, her home was situated on one of the walls in Jericho. And they told her that she was to hang a scarlet thread, a scarlet rope out of her window, and all of Israel would know that everyone in that household was to be protected and preserved in the coming battle. And so that's what they did. Now, that's, that's a pretty cool part of the story. You're like, wow, that's, look at what God did. He protected the spies and then protected Rahab's family, but it gets even better than that. This, this is one of those things. You, you, you can't even make up the goodness of God. You, you can't even, this, this is how God's goodness multiplies over the years and generations. Because Rahab, who was not an Israelite, by the way, and if she had been an Israelite, she, they would not have been smiling on her chosen profession. But Rahab was, from that moment, adopted and grafted into the family of Israel. And Rahab became an ancestor of a man by the name of Jesse. And Jesse had some boys who, who grew up, one of whom grew up to become King David. Rahab was a several times great-grandmother of King David. King David, who was an ancestor of the Son of God when he was born to Joseph and Mary in Bethlehem. So God took this prostitute who was demonstrating faithfulness and used her and wove her into the fabric and the story of his redemption through Jesus Christ. She became 
a blood relative of the Savior of the world. I, I wonder today, is, is there anybody here who thinks even for a second God can't use you? I mean, can you, you can't even make this up. If you were watching this on Netflix, you would be like, that's not even plausible. <laughs> and yet that's what God did. You want to talk about overcoming? Overcoming her past? Overcoming her profession? Overcoming her shame? And using her in the story of redemption of the world? I think it's fascinating that Joshua said, the Lord has given you victory this day. Before they ever lifted a spear, before they ever shouted anything, the victory was already won. It's fascinating because that's what Jesus did. In John chapter 16, Jesus told his followers, Ordinary people like you and me. He said, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. There will be walls. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. And what's fascinating about this statement is he made it before he went to the cross, before he rose from the dead. The end had already been determined. There was no question Jesus' power Jesus' authority to overcome death, to overcome the world, because he loves you, because he loves me. He said, take heart, for he has overcome the world. The power's not in me. The power's not in you. The power is in Christ. If you're here today and you've never stepped into a relationship with Jesus, you've never taken on his power to overcome your sin, your past, your shame, you're no worse off than Rahab was. And yet he has overcome all of it through his death, burial, and resurrection. If you'd like to take hold of that, in just a moment, we want to give you the opportunity to do that. It, it, it happens with a choice to respond to his grace initiative. To just pray. A prayer of beginning, a prayer of surrender. To follow the only one who will never take advantage of your surrender but will only use it for his glory and your good. I want to ask you to bow your heads for just a moment. If you have prayed that prayer before, then I invite you to just be praying for the people sitting around you who maybe haven't. And if you never have prayed that prayer, then we want to invite you to do that right now, to just pray right where you're sitting and say silently, silently just from your heart to God, say something like this, Jesus, I need you. I need you, and so I confess my sin to you. I confess my sin in order to claim and receive your forgiveness. And I will follow you from this moment forward. I know it won't be perfect. But it will be sincere and it will be forever. This is my prayer, Jesus, in your name. I want to ask you just to remain with your heads bowed for a moment. With 
every eye closed. If that was your prayer, then this is the greatest moment of your life. And as a church, we would love to help with the moments that follow because this is just the beginning for you. When we dismiss in just a moment and you exit through the main lobby, there's a place there called the welcome area. And we would love to give you something to help in this new faith journey. Just a, it's just a Bible with a reading plan that will help you begin to grow in this relationship with God. Second of all, as our heads are bowed for just a moment, if that was your prayer, would you just raise your hand? Just raise your hand and hold it up high over your head for just a moment because your hand represents a statement physically of the commitment spiritually that you just made. And so as a church, we honor that. We celebrate that with you. And our family tradition around here is as you put your hands down, we're going to put our hands together and tell you, welcome home. Welcome home.